Hey everybody, Ed Homewood, Old Guy Hi-Fi. Today we're gonna to take a look at the Arcam A25. Again, another chapter in the continuing saga of Old Guy Hi-Fi reviewing integrated amplifiers. So we've got this Arcam unit in, sit back, relax, and we'll get talking about it. Oh, the old guy's Hi-Fi was spreading the night. Bridging past and pressing in the glow of autumn light. He holds the future gently like he held the past so tight in the old guy's hi-fi. Everything feels right. So the RKM A25 is a 100 watt per channel into 8 ohm integrated amplifier. It's 165 watts into 4 ohms, and it is a class G. We'll talk about that in just a second. Um, we're going to take a look at the front panel. We're gonna look at the back and we're gonna talk about a bunch of different things. It has a built-in deck. It has an ESS 9280A Pro. Now that's an interesting deck because it is a deck and a headphone amplifier on one chip. Um, it has, uh, we'll do 32-bit uh, 384 up to DSD 512 and on spit if it'll do 24-192. Um, it does have a phono preamp in and I did test it. Um, it does have uh, pre-out for subwoofers. When we spin it around, we'll take a look at it. So we're going to go in on the front panel. It's a little hard to see the display, and that's kind of one of the gripes I have. But anyway, let, we'll take a look at the front panel. We'll take a look at the back panel. We'll open it up, and then I'll talk about how it sounds. So here we are looking at the front panel of the Arcam A25. So input selector here as you rotate it around, and then you push the center to initiate that. Um, so it's actually pretty simple. And also, you can do the same thing from the remote control obviously go through it, and then you hit the center button to initiate it. So whatever you choose, you got to push that button to make it take effect. And then of course there's a volume control. Oh, I failed to mention there's a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. One of the things that I'm not a big fan of, and let me zoom in a little bit on this, is this display is very fuzzy. It's kind of a frosted front panel, <clears throat> and it's very difficult sometimes to see it at a distance. It's kind of vague, sort of slightly out of focus. I don't know. I'm not a big fan of that, but it's pretty easy and the remote control works well. And again, few issues at all. And of course the volume control, decent knob feel. It's kind of plastic, but it's fine. I mean, given its price point, what do you expect? So anyway, that's the front panel of the Arcam A25. We're going to spin it around and look at the back. Here you can see on the back panel of the Arcam A25, uh, we've got our IEC power socket, master power switch, voltage selector. This is a USB-A service port. There is five volts on it. So if you wanted to drive a small little outboard DAC that was five volts powered or a WEEM or something like that, you could. Basically a standard telephone jack for control, and that goes out to Crestron. Harman, of course, owns a large control company, so that would be right into their, uh, in, in their wheelhouse doing that. If you had a little IR receiver, you could plug it in there if this was going to live behind a cabinet. 12-volt trigger in, and then our DAC, where we've got optical SPDIF, coax SPDIF, and USB on USB-C. We've got one, two, three single-ended inputs, no balanced on this. Phono input for moving magnet and ground, and then a pre-out to run your subs, and of course, pair of speaker binding posts of good quality. So overall, the, actually, the back panel's not bad on this unit at all. It's a little thin on features, um, but very functional. One thing I hate is, and I know it's hard to see, it has this lip over the back that obscures it. If you're trying to look over to see where your connections are, you can't. I mean, it's nice, it's probably decorative and hides cables or things like that when it's you know on a sideboard and you don't want to see that stuff. But boy, it made it a little challenging as I was plugging in stuff in and out of it. Anyway, so that's the back panel of the Arcam A25, and hopefully you enjoyed that, and hopefully you consider giving me a like and a subscribe. All right, let's go open it up and look inside, and then we'll talk about how it sounds. So here we are looking at the inside of the Arcam A25 integrated amplifier. You can see nice big Toretto power transformer. There are 20,000 microfarads of capacitance here in these two, and the, each of these is 6,800 microfarads. These are the output devices. There's four, so it's a push-pull. And again, one of the things that kind of gets to me a little bit is the surface mount technology. And we'll talk about that in a second. This is the DAC board. It uses the ESS9280 uh, Pro, which is, in addition to being a DAC, is also a headphone amplifier, and it does have a headphone amp. So looking at the surface mount technology, I'm not sure to me, through-hole is the best, and that's just an opinion maybe because I've had a lot of people tell me that 
surface mount is just fine, but I've always found that the best sounding amplifiers and the most powerful sounding amplifiers to me have always been through hole. Now, class G is different, and as I would mentioned, it's a variation on class AB, but it's not digital, although it is a switching amp. And the way they do that is they use different power rails for there's a low voltage rail for quieter passages and a higher voltage rail for louder passages. So it's constantly switching between the low voltage and high voltage because music is very dynamic. It depends on the amplitude. Obviously, if it's a quiet passage, it's gonna be running all on the low voltage rail. If it's a very loud passage, it's gonna be running on the high voltage rail, high output voltage rail. The, the difference is that the idea behind it is efficiency. Obviously, class A makes a ton of heat, a ton of heat. Class A, B, makes less heat, but not as little heat as this. And this makes some heat, not unlike class D, which really doesn't make a lot of heat. So this is kind of the solid state version or the, I guess, the, the traditional kind of way to do a switching amplifier without going to class D. And that's kind of the idea behind it. Um, it's the, the, the idea is low power consumption, good thermal efficiency, good power efficiency, but has a similar sonic character to a class AB amplifier. So it is what it is. Um, again, and I'll show some close-ups of the various things and I'll show some close-ups of the DAC itself. So that's the inside of the RCAM A25 integrated amplifier. And let's button it back up and we'll talk about how it sounds. Well, as you can see from looking inside the RCAM A25, it is surface mount construction. And I've had a lot of people tell me it doesn't matter. Um, but I will be honest, all of the really good equipment I've ever heard and have and are listening to now that sounds really good is all through hole. I think it's better for current delivery. I think it's better for dynamics. I think it's just better overall, personally. Now, I can't be sure of that with a class G amplifier because class G amplifiers work different. So Standard Class A amplifiers are running full tilt boogie. Those transistors are at their maximum capacity all the time, and you attenuate the input, and that's how you regulate the output of the amplifiers by putting lower voltages in on the front end, and so it's not amplified as much, even though the amplifier is running full out. Class AB does that, Class A for a couple of watts or so, and then switches into Class AB where you go from one transistor to the other. One handles the positive side, one handles the negative side, <clears throat> and the idea is that that volume, you're not going to hear the, the not distortion or crossover distortion between one transistor and the other. Um, and again, you attenuate the input on it. Now with, but those transistors run in class AB, they're switching on and off, but they're switching on and off with the signal. With class G, because they use different power rails, the power supply is actually doing the switching so that you kind of theoretically get the sound of class a b but the the power efficiency or the the thermal efficiency and power consumption efficiency of something like a class d a class d is a switching amplifier a class d are not digital just so you know they are an analog amplifier and this is as well but it's in a different format it's using actual transistor output devices rather than chip based for the inexpensive class d's but when you get into the more expensive class d stuff like hypex and or purify ice modules, those kinds of things. They actually use MOSFET transistors and the power supply switches at such a high speed that that's where it gets its efficiency. Um, and this one is somewhere in between that. And I don't know if it's that power supply switching that contributes to sound quality or not. I don't know for sure, but I will tell you that I was kind of unimpressed. Um, and I put it on everything. I ran it with all my best acts, the Live Harmony, the Gishelli Daisy, I ran it with the Heifeman uh, ladder DAC, I ran it with my Shit by Frost, um, so, and I ran it through all of the good speakers I have here, the Big Wharftails, the Elac DVR-62s, the um, Triangle Duetto 40, as part of their Magellan series, $7,000 pair of stand mount speakers, very high end. I, I ran everything I could into this, and, and even a turntable, I used that TX turntable back there. And it's got a good phono preamp, by the way. So. And it was pleasing. So overall sound, what I did was I listened to this recording from Chick Corea called Now He Sings, Now He Sobs. It was recorded in 1966, but it wasn't released until 1968. So it's one of his very early recordings. And the thing I like about it is 60s recordings tend to be real mid-rangey. Um, I think it's just limitations of the gear they had, tape, whatever. But all the and all the musicians were in the studio at the same time, so you kind of get bleed over, and you know the musicians are looking at each other and kind of feeding off each other's energy. So there's a certain kind of I don't know uh, feeling or 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 mood created by those kinds of recordings that I really enjoy, uh, and it 
sounded very good on this. It wasn't a lot of bass. It wasn't a lot of high frequencies. And the cymbal sounded a little splashy, and I'm not going to attribute it to this. It may attribute it to just limitations of the recording in those days. Um, but overall, a lot of piano, very heavily piano, obviously, Chick Corea. Overall, the, this, this was very lean sounding, and I'll expound on that a little more in a second. To kind of get some more crazy stuff with bass and all kinds of uh, uh, sound effects and things like that, I listened to this recording from Enigma, Love, Sensuality, and Devotion, The Greatest Hits. Um, and it's electronica, and it's crazy, and it's all over the place, but there's really good bass, there's really good everything, high frequencies, all that. And again, and it's going to be an overriding theme, this was, it was just lean. Um, and I'll talk about specifics when, after I talk about the recordings I used. So it was just kind of lean, unengaging, maybe is a, a, a good description of it as well. Um, to tr try to get a better sense of, because I know the recording and I know how they recorded it, it's with the Caudillet Quartet, Beethoven String Quartets, Opus 132 and H34. They record intimately in a, in a kind of a, a little bit of a live studio, a little bit of a live sounding studio as far as uh, there is a little bit of room presence that you detect. It's not a dampened studio where everybody's in kind of a recording booth with, you know, um, sound dampening on the walls. Um, I didn't get a great sense, a room sense. And I know the recording because I've listened to it many times. There wasn't a great sense of room, um, space, or that kind of stuff. Because in that recording, you know, you can hear the floor, you can hear the wall, you can hear the ceilings. Um, and again, because it's intimately mic'd, I mean, it's for quartet. They're all sitting within a few feet of each other playing their instruments. I didn't get a great sense of instrument body, on, especially on the cello and the viola. I didn't get a great sense of, you know, bow on the strings kind of either. Again, it's very lean. Um, and again, I'll talk about it in more detail. Um, and I didn't, so I didn't get a huge sense of, of room space or presence, I guess. So let's talk about the sound. Bass response was okay, but that's about it. It was just okay. It didn't dig super deep. It wasn't particularly agile. Um, it was reasonably articulate, um, and it was reasonably okay. I mean, it sounded more or less natural. Mid-bass, same thing. It was okay. Drum sounded fine. Attack was good. Um, not, not a great pace to it, but it, again, a, a lack of agility, I think. Through the mid-range, it was... Not fatiguing, but it was thin. It was lean. It was unengaging. I guess it's just it didn't. I it didn't grab me and pull me in. And it really at all on any recordings. I listened to a lot of stuff on it. I listened to a lot of recordings. I listened to. You recently saw the review of the Cambridge CXA eighty one Mark II and that Tadeshi Trucks album and Susan Tadeshi's voice. I listened to that on this, and it just didn't have an engagement factor. It just it wasn't. I almost felt like I, I could have been distracted really easy to go do something else. I just wasn't present and engaged and involved as much with this. And so as far as frequency response, it was all there. It just was just kind of flat, not super dynamic. There was not a lot of dynamic swings. I thought transients just seemed just kind of lazy going up and they decayed. Okay, but there wasn't a ton of detail. As far as image goes, it was a good center image. It never really got more than the width of whatever the speakers were. And the, and the triangles, those things image like monsters. It just didn't, that was not a great pairing with this um, because the leanness of that at the horn, magnesium horn tweeter on those, it's just a little, you, you expect more detail out of that horn tweeter and it just wasn't, this wasn't delivering it. Um, so just the image was okay. Wasn't a lot of depth. Um, there wasn't a lot of width. Height was okay. Center was very good. No problem there. Instrument location was okay, a bit vague. Um, and again, you know, other than the quartet, you know, all the other stuff was whatever, whatever imaging there was is manufactured in the studio. But I just, and I listened to a lot of other recordings on this because I really, I thought this isn't what I was expecting. So let me throw some other stuff at it. Let me throw a better deck at it. Let me throw the best speakers I got in the house on it. And it just, it never got me involved. It never engaged me. So let's talk about the comparisons because I know you guys are going to ask. You recently saw the review of the Cambridge CXA 81 Mark II. It is a better unit, a lot better unit, I think. It's far more dynamic. It is far more ballsy. It's got good speed, very articulate, um, very engaging. 
that very smooth and very detailed sound all the way up through all the frequencies, great imaging, huge image on the triangles, um, just really far more engaging and far more, you know, I felt like I was more involved in listening with that amplifier than I was with this. The next question is Audio Lab 6000A. This is a way better amp than that. Similar a bit in sound in the leanness department, but not fatiguing. This didn't have any fatigue factor at all. It just didn't have a lot of engagement factor either, I guess. Um, so not the Audio Lab is in it kind of in its own, you know, penalty box all by itself. The next question is going to be the Advanced Paris A70, uh, XI75. And I think that's a better amp as far as, look, as far as goes in and goes out as in future set and that kind of stuff, the Advanced Paris is, a, you know, leading the league on that stuff. Loads it goes into, loads it goes out. It's got a great built-in DAC. That Wilson chip in there is just wonderful. This DAC is okay. Uh, but it, again, it's a, it's a DAC headphone amp on one chip. So I don't know if that's a limiting factor. I didn't find it to be bad. I just didn't find the whole presentation to be engaging. So the Advanced Paris is very warm and lush and amazing and just cozy and a wonderful sounding amplifier, uh, different than the Cambridge, but they're very close. I, would, I, I couldn't choose between the two if I really had to maybe. If I really had to, I'd go with the Cambridge just because it's got so much dynamicism. But anyway, um, I also have another advanced Paris over there, the A7 uh, streaming amplifier, which the review will be out soon. It's again, I'm in, I've got integrated amps to review all over the place. This isn't a bad product. I just couldn't warm up to it. I couldn't find, I, it just didn't engage me. It didn't capture my attention very well. I felt, like I said, I felt like I could be easily distracted. It's a well-built unit. It's a good company. I just don't know what it is. Maybe the Class G, maybe the surface mount. I, I can't put my finger on what it is. I just, I couldn't warm up to it. It's not bad. I couldn't live with it. Um, anyway, it is what it is. I, and at $1,500, I don't know that it's a bad deal. I may not have had, you know, the right pair of speakers to, to match up with this. And there is a lot to be said for system synergy, but I've got a variety of different speakers with a variety of different sonic characters to them, and I just couldn't find one that matched. Anyway, so that's that. That's the Arcam A25. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. Hopefully you're willing to give me a like and a subscribe. And if you wish to support the channel, there is a thank you button at the bottom of the video window. And they're also in the pin description and in the video description would be a link to join the channel if you so desire. Also in the video description, Amazon affiliate links, you know how those work. Uh, my playlist, comment on those. Please send me playlists. Please check out the community playlist. There's some great stuff there. Please comment, let me know. Am I crazy, am I wrong? Have I lost my mind, am I an old fool? Um, you know, what's been your experience? I can only base it on, you know, my particular taste. And again, all my reviews are subjective. So please comment. Please keep the comments polite. Please be careful with your language in the comments because uh, YouTube will flag those and you won't see them. Anyway, I think I've covered all the bases. So again, please like, please subscribe, please comment for sure. Please comment. And if you wish, you can follow me on Instagram. Um, that's the Arcam A25. I'm Ed Homewood. This is the Old Guy Hi-Fi channel. And now it's time for you to sit back and find some music you really love, get engaged, and listen for the rest of the afternoon. Thank you so very much for your time. I am grateful for it. Have a wonderful day.